Today we're ready to talk, of, talk with Jason Ramsden um, about communicating and connecting with social media. As I mentioned earlier, I'm Madeline Sincosti, the community manager over at Social Media, um, and welcome to today's presentation and discussion. As many of you know, we are going to be speaking with Jason Ramsden, a co-author of Communicating and Connecting with Social Media, about the integral use of social media and its use in our schools. If you're tweeting about the webinar today, be sure to include the hashtag EdSocialMedia so we can track the conversation and answer your questions. Jason will be tracking as many questions as he can throughout the presentation, and I'll keep a close eye on any that come up as well. So feel free to drop a note into the question box in the GoToWebinar interface. If all goes according to plan, we will have a recorded version of today's presentation for you to view later. We will make a post on the Ed Social Media blog where you can view the recorded webinar. As some of you know, Jason is the Chief Technology Officer at Ravenscroft School in Raleigh, North Carolina. He's very active on Twitter at Raven Tech. He blogs about technology and education on his site at jasonramsden.com. He also curates the education and technology newsletter, A Cup of Joe with the CTO. Jason, thank you very much for joining us and pulling all this together. We're eager to hear about how to use social media to communicate effectively about your school and how it can enhance your professional development for educators. Beyond, Madeline, I appreciate it. Yeah. And my apologies to everyone for uh, being a little late. You only goes to show that even tech folks have tech problems. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, as Madeline said, my name is Jason Ramsden. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Ravenscroft School. And uh, the first slide here, I just want to make note, um, if you are tweeting today about the, the webinar, Madeline mentioned it, but please use Ed Social Media uh, as a hashtag. And if you uh, want to tweet directly to me at Raventech, uh, I've got another screen up monitoring the session, so I'll try and answer questions as we go along. So uh, before we get started, um, one thing I want to talk about is, is just the book in general, um, just to give you a rough idea. It's broken down into to three parts for those of you who haven't seen it. It's uh, communicating with social media, which talks about how schools can use social media as a tool to uh, disseminate information about uh, what they're doing, the good news that they're doing. We also have a chapter that's about connecting with social media, which is more about personal learning networks. And, and then there's also a, a small piece in there about being um, professionally responsible when you're working in social media spaces, which talks a little bit about voice choice and deciding uh, if you're talking you know, from a position at your school or as an individual edu educator, et cetera, when you're, when you're talking about personal learning networks. And then we also talk a little bit about the, the future of social media uh, in schools. So that's kind of the book. I, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the book. I'm going to talk a little bit more about primarily about communicating with social media today, uh, but it just gives you a sense of what's in the book. It's a real practical guide um, that has a lot of uh, rubrics in it that you can use if you're just getting started in uh, social media, either communicating or using it as a tool to communicate uh, with your constituents or whether you're looking to build your PLN. Uh, when I got started, uh, looking at the list of people who are going to be in the session today, um, I see that a, a lot of you are already in social media spaces, and there's a handful of folks that are not. So I'm going to try and engage the webinar a little bit uh, to both sides if I can. Uh, for those of you that are in the space, talking a little bit about um, kind of where, where you go next, and then for those who are not in the space, kind of give you a, a, an idea of kind of framing uh, how you communicate with social media as a school. So first off, the very first rule I want to talk about um, when you're dealing with social media is this. Um, it's, this came across um, my Twitter account not too long ago. I actually wrote a post about it for Red Social Media called The First Rule. Um, and the first rule of social media uh, is likened to the movie Fight Club. And if you haven't seen Fight Club, um, it's, it's a movie with Brad Pitt and Ed Norton in it that has certain rules for Fight Club. And what those are is basically to say the first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. And the second rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. And that's the same thing when you're dealing with social media. Um, I believe um, that social media has just been a convergence of um, two sides of our lives that have finally come together. Uh, 
right? Individuals or humans or social beings by nature. Uh, we want to connect. We want to communicate with each other. We want to share what's happening in our lives, what's happening in our work, our school, et cetera. And that's, that's been going on since the beginning of time. Uh, and media has always been around. Uh, in, in my blog post, I talk a little bit about um, how the printing press back in the 1400s um, was actually media, uh, the beginning of media. And it's only until recently, until um, both of those sides have kind of converged uh, together to give you social media. But I don't think you really need to talk about social media when you're in the social media club. A, because it's kind of scary uh, people a little bit to talk about social media. But the other part is it's, it's, just, a, it's just a common um, path towards which we're headed to actually talk about the good things that are happening in our schools and having transparent conversations. So um, you note know, at the bottom there's a little hashtag not in the book. We don't talk about that in the book. It's just something that's kind of come to be um, since the book was written. But so um, when I was doing a little research here for um, this webinar, I came across this Welsh proverb. Uh, you can see it on your screen. It says, bad news goes about in clogs and good news and stocking feet. And I love um, this proverb, uh, partly because it talks about bad news um, being noisy, uh, and that typically is what um, traditionally has found its way into the media, bad news, noisy, people are talking about it, and good news and stocking feet, much like the uh, children kind of walking down the stairs at at the, the holiday time looking for presents, it's quiet, they're looking for something good, it, it kind of goes under the radar. And um, I put that out there because I, I think it tends to, like most proverbs, deal with things that happened a long time ago. And so when you're dealing with media, uh, before you had a chance to have your voice choice and, and have the ability to um, kind of frame the conversation, it was that way. Um, it was hard to get your school's news in the newspaper and traditional media, public relations, um, press releases, those sort of things. And good news kind of just went by the wayside. So I, I think it's important to note that because in today's age, when we're talking about social media and schools, if you're not telling your story, someone else will. And I think that's a, a really good um, kind of preamble to the entire conversation. So for those of you that are already uh, in social media spaces and, and using social media to tell your story, you know this. If You know that if you're not telling your, somebody, your story, someone else will. And for those of you just embarking on that journey, it's an important point. Um, if you're trying to sell it to somebody at your school who wants to know why you should be involved in social media, it's a good starting point. So if you're not telling your story, someone else definitely will be. And so you kind of want to control your message. And I think that's a little bit of what social media has uh, to offer for us. And so I took the liberty of kind of rewriting that uh, Welsh proverb into something like this. So transparent sharing helps put the stock in the stocking feet of good news. And so there's a Ramsden proverb for you. And what I mean by stock is the meat, uh, the kind of the, the good news. You have the ability to put a stock in what you're doing and getting the word out. So um, that's kind of my proverb for you today to get you started. Transparent sharing helps you put the stock in the stocking feet of good news. Okay, so where do we head next? Well, when you're first starting to communicate with social media, um, there's some things that you have to keep in mind. And I was racking my head a little bit trying to figure out how to how to bring this to be so that people kind of understand um, communicating with social media. And so I was doing a little bit of research. My family uh, loves the show Modern Family. Um, and when I was doing a little research on just the show, looking for either quotes or something that could be brought into this, I came across, across this uh, article in Yahoo Finance that says, oddly enough, that social media users are hooked on Modern Family. And it was a great article. Uh, the link is there, I'll share it out later, but it talked about the entire metrics of how you measure social media and how mo social media is being talked about, uh, shows like Modern Family are being talked about in social media spaces and, and people are actually determining how that's uh, affecting brands and that sort of thing. But because I love Modern Family so much, um, I wanted to share just a brief clip of what I believe is is kind of the the starting point of diving into social media. 
and so it'll come across here. Hey, Jason, it looks like the audio isn't coming through for the rest of us to hear what's going on. Okay, apparently y'all couldn't hear the clip. I uh, see that message coming across now, but that's okay. Uh, it may be better without the clip, uh, but you can find it online. Uh, it's called, uh, I'll put it up a little bit later, but in the opening scene, uh, Phil remarks a little bit about, um, they're reminiscing about old times, and he says, you know, this place has really changed, and they're kind of overlooking uh, Los Angeles. Time marches on. See that Starbucks down there? Uh, you know what that used to be? And in the back, his daughter Alex says, an orange grove? And Phil says, no, no, a Burger King. You can still see some of the architecture there. And I think that's kind of when schools are talking about uh, social media, they're talking about things along the lines of um, looking at um, a frame of reference in terms of timelines. And so Phil was talking about just shortly back and his daughter Alex was talking way back. And we're trying to figure out where does this all fit in our schools in terms of uh, time frames. Um, and it's true, you know, Phil remarked that the landscape, uh, the landscape has changed. And I think that's true uh, when you're talking about social media in general in your school. So if you're not there, you definitely want to be there. And if you are there, what do you do to take it to the next level? And then further along in the clip, um, the son, Luke, says, my stomach hurts. And uh, the mom, Claire, says, told you not to eat too fast. Uh, and I think that's, oddly enough, what people think about when, when they're talking about social media. Their head spins, their stomach hurts a little bit. They're not sure where to jump in. And sometimes they go too fast when they get to that point. And, and I think it's an important reminder is that as you're starting to jump into social media spaces that you have an opportunity to kind of figure out what pace do I go in, what do I try to do, where do I need to be, uh, and what things I'm going to try to do, especially um, if you're a smaller shop and there's just one of you and your social media approach may be just uh, one or two things that you can handle at any given time. So, and then a little bit later in the clip, uh, when Claire is kind of waving her arms at Phil, she asks a very important question. What's the plan, Phil, she shouts. And so I think that's true of social media in general. I think Claire's actually got it down pat for those of you in social media. And so what is the plan? And I, I want you to share uh, with the hashtag Ed Social Media. When you're talking about your plan for social media, these are four of the bigger ones that are out there, obviously LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. What's your plan? Where do you plan to live? How do you plan to be there? 
what are your goals and your strategies for being in that space. If you don't have a plan, and I think it's a critical point because in the other uh, part of that clip when Phil jumps on the hood, he says, at least I'm trying to do something. And so the question is, are you trying to do just something or are you trying to be in a space and do it well? And I think that's the next part of social media is, is something good enough? Is something good enough? Is it just good enough to be in these spaces? LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or is it more importantly to pick a single space and have it linked back to your site? And what's your ultimate goal of being in those spaces? So is being in the space good enough is a good question to consider as you're moving through this. All right. Um, uh, this slide, um, where does social media reside? I throw this up there. Uh, I had the good fortune um, a couple weeks ago to go to Internet Summit 2011. And that was a, 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 a summit here in Raleigh, uh, down at our convention center, that was for businesses uh, doing internet marketing and other sorts of things. And they brought up an interesting equation, which I, I raise here for those of us in school. Um, they noted that um, in social media, in a business, that 81% uh, of social media work inside a business resided in the marketing department, 62% in the digital media uh, department, 48% in the public relations department, and 20%, 26% in the customer service market, uh, customer service division of a, of a business. And I started thinking, how does that apply to a school setting? So where does social media reside in your school? Is it in the admissions office? Is it in the communications? Is it in the technology uh, department? Where does it live and how does it live there? Um, who's responsible for it ultimately and I think that's a good a good point whether you're in it now um, what are the relationships I can speak here at Ravenscroft uh, Penny Rogers is our director of communications uh, and Susan Washburn is our assistant director of communications and they actually are responsible for social media and the communications office which lives in advancement so it ties into the website side but to be honest I have a huge um, hand in that as well and I think when you have your communications director and your technology uh, director working together, that's kind of the best blend um, for, for folks in independent schools uh, in terms of being uh, present in social media. So I think it's fine for it to reside in the communication side, but your tech person sure darn well know how it all works and how they can help um, further the message. So. Um, that's also another important key aspect when you're talking about where does it reside in your institution. So back to this, what are your strategic goals? Um, when I was uh, at the Internet Summit uh, a few weeks ago, I saw a, a slide that was done or a presentation that was done by uh, PBS, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, in PBS, they said, um, what are you doing? in terms of strategic goals for social media. And they kind of said, you know, our goal is to attract more viewers. Uh, not only to attract more viewers, but even to attract our current viewers to our social media sites. So I started thinking about, for schools, what does that mean? Do we even have strategic goals around being in a social media market? Um, and, and if we do, do we have them for each individual place where we reside? So do you have strategic goals for your Facebook audience? Do you have strategic goals for your Twitter, or your LinkedIn, uh, your blog audience, your t YouTube, your Flickr? Um, and that's important to note, because I think uh, if you don't have a strategy around um, how you're gonna use each tool, uh, what you'll find is um, some, somebody will use Twitter, and when they tweet, it goes to LinkedIn, and it goes to Facebook, and so it's the same message everywhere. Is that a strategic goal you want for your institution? So I raise that question because I think it's important to note that it's probably not the best strategy to tweet and have it be put in LinkedIn and Facebook. And why? Uh, for somebody who is really connected in all those places and may follow you in every single place, your message gets droned out. So what are you doing for exclusive content? Where do you put it? How do you use it? Uh, are you repurposing and remixing content as part of your strategic goals and where does that live? 
uh, are you taking polls of your constituents? Where, where are they living in social media, if anywhere? Uh, and if they are, how are you engaging them? Are you asking for their feedback? Uh, so those are all important pieces of strategic goals, I think, when you're talking about being in the, in the social media space. All right, so I think it's a good stopping point here uh, at the moment to kind of take some questions. Um, this is actually going to fill up real quick with anything that's uh, been used for the hashtag for Ed Social Media. I don't know if there's any questions in there. Uh, Madeline, are there any questions in the chat room? Um, there aren't any currently in the chat room. There is a lot of chatter with the hashtag, but I have one that immediately comes to mind. And Jason, I love that you mentioned to not kind of cross post across all these social platforms because to me, you know, as somebody that's in this space quite a bit, I'm starting to see these repeating messages. So what do you, what do you tell folks when that kind of is their practice right now? How do they move away from that? Well, I, I think you have to decide um, what what works best and when, when you're talking about your time and your return on investment, I know why people do it, um, because it's easy to use a tool like Hootsuite and tweet it and then also have it go post to LinkedIn um, and Facebook with you know your two uh, hashtags and so that it makes it real easy to post out there. But I find for myself when um, I go into a stream, especially if somebody who's doing it quickly, uh, making all their posts kind of, you know what, it's uh, 11 o'clock and between 11 and 12 I do all my social media. Well, all of a sudden you have post, 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 and if I go to Facebook I see the same thing, if I go to LinkedIn I see the same thing, I go to Twitter I see the same thing. So my recommendation there would be to um, tie it into a plan of not necessarily always um, tweeting at the same time of day. Um, there are tools where you can actually schedule your tweets um, which then could, if you decide to use that same tool, for instance, um, Hootsuite is a tool that I use personally, the school also uses it, um, you can say, all right, I'm going to take this tweet, I'm going to send it, or I'm going to take this piece of information and send it to Twitter. This next piece of information is going to go to Facebook only, the next piece of information is going to go to Facebook and uh, LinkedIn, depending on what the content is. So I think you need to consider what your content is, and then consider where it best lives. Great, thank you, I agree. Um, another question came in said from John LaPert. She says, I give my posts a voice or a persona. Do you recommend this? Oh, absolutely, 100%. Um, uh, I think one of the best parts about social media is to have a little bit of, um, I don't know, what you wanna call it, personality or, or, or livelihood to your, to your tweets or your posts so that it's not just news, news, news. Um, there was something that I found a couple of years ago when I was first talking about social media and, and it was something along the lines of, um, you know, do you prefer your posts um, caffeinated or decaffeinated? You know, it was one of those things where they kind of were making fun of how they were posting or what information they were sharing and do you want it, you know, full blown, uh, the high fat, fat content or you just want the light version? And it, it kind of made sense to me when you're working in that um, in that space to kind of add a little bit of life to it because otherwise you don't want people to feel like it's just news. I agree. I think that's a great answer. I love that the caffeinated or decaffeinated, high fat or light. Um, I think we have one more coming in here. And how do you really measure? This is also from John. John, thank you for your questions. How do you really measure effectiveness? The new stats are confusing to him as well as a lot of other people. So how do you analyze what you do? You know, I think that's a fantastic question. And it's, I'll tell you quite honestly, it's something that we're just wrapping our heads around. Um, like I said before, Penny Rogers is our director of communications and uh, we both attended that internet summit. And I actually went to a session on analytics alone. And it, to me, it, it could almost become a full-time job to, to uh, do your analytics in all the spaces uh, because they were talking about things along the lines of uh, it was like uh, almost like quiet referrals like you don't know that it actually comes in from a certain site if you're using just Google Analytics um, without any sort of plug into it you're not going to catch a lot of the social media uh, because it looks like it's coming direct to your site as opposed to being referred from a social media site but I think you ultimately have to tie it back into what your strategic goals are for working in the spaces. 
Um, so if you don't have a strategy and goals for each space, it makes it even that much more difficult to measure. Um, another one we had come in is. Go ahead, Nano. Go ahead. That was, I think, what you saw with the hashtag. How do you maintain a consistent okay. voice? So, and I think that's difficult um, when you're when you're have more than one person creating or posting content. But I think there's a way around it if uh, if you can kind of decide topic based uh, what each of the individuals is creating or posting. So uh, maybe you have somebody who is just um, tweeting or posting on social media sites about athletics and maybe somebody else is taking on uh, the life of the school and maybe somebody else is taking on the fine arts part so that there's a consistent voice that falls within them if you have that many people obviously um, creating or posting content that may be a way to look at it as topic based I think maybe finding that central artery too right Jason like a central hub where it helps kind of track um, who's posting what at what point in time will um, also help you kind of know when and who is posting where. Exactly, exactly. And that's actually, um, I'm going to uh, kind of move on a little bit here, keep an eye on time, but we'll, we'll come back to questions. Um, so one of the other things that was raised, um, or I'd like to raise, is, you know, if you build it, will they come? And that's a great point. Um, if you're spending time investing on developing a Facebook page and putting content there, how do you know that they're going to come? And when they come, how are they? How you know they're going to stay? And what are you doing to build that? Um, build that awareness about the site. Um, for one, for something that we did, for instance, I think at one point uh, last year we had maybe 190. Uh, like likes on our Facebook page and so we actually did a little bit of a promotion we we decided to give away an iPad for everybody who liked our our Facebook page between X day uh, and X time you know we gave it a, a, a window of time and then did a raffle and we saw somewhere like a 250 percent increase just from that one giving that one iPad away and so We've actually gone from about 190 likes, uh, almost pushing 700. Um, so it's continuing to grow, but it's okay. We've built it now. People are there. And if, when you build it, will they continue to come back? Uh, one of the interesting stats that I heard um, is that um, a link that you post, whether it be in Twitter uh, or Facebook, probably more appropriate, or even LinkedIn, if you put a link out there in Facebook, the likelihood of that being shared increases by 10% if somebody comments on it, uh, which I thought was a real interesting statistic. So how do you actually get people engaged in the conversation? And that's an important piece to, to consider as you're kind of developing what's your voice and who's, uh, who's uh, posting where and when and how. Okay. And we talked, you know, Madeline, you made reference of this a little bit, but uh, this this is something we talked about at the at the summit as well. Is when do you share? Um, are you always sharing your social media at a certain set time during the day? And if you are, is your audience there? I know we can go on and and look at it, but for folks who um, are involved in social media or who in that who are in those spaces are most likely in those spaces, uh, meaning that they've been there for a while and they probably have a lot of content. And so, if uh, the school is posting something at 10 o'clock every day, I may not be in. A parent may not be in Facebook or Twitter or even LinkedIn at 10 o'clock in the day, you know, during the daytime. And if they're very involved in social media, that may get buried. Um, I think someone said once that the, the life of a Twitter link is like six minutes, that it gets buried that fast for people who have a lot of followers. So the question is, when do you share? And uh, I'm not saying that you should be sharing at 11 o'clock at night uh, and, and expanding your work hours to 24 hours a day. There's definitely tools you can use to do that, but you need to consider that question. When do you share your content? And it's going to be different on each site, I think. All right, um, so this is along the topics of when do you share, and uh, I mentioned this earlier, Hootsuite is a great 
um, social media uh, management tool. I use it personally. We use it here at Ravenscroft. Um, there's obviously a lot of uh, large companies that use it well to uh, use it as well to manage uh, because you can have multiple social profiles. Uh, you can schedule your messages. You can actually do analytics as well, and uh, it's just a fantastic tool. And the pricing is actually pretty good uh, for those of us involved in the space. Um, on this dashboard, they are showing Google Plus. Um, it's coming as an app. It's not built in as a place, um, as a social profile just yet. Um, but it, once that does, I think that'll make a huge difference for folks. I'm, if, I know, for instance, for me, I'm not big in Google Plus at the moment because I use Hootsuite. So basically, the tool has then determined where I share, which isn't a good thing. But uh, it definitely is something to consider when you're thinking about different tools. And a couple of the other tools that came across on when do you share, uh, Sendable is another one um, that allows you to uh, set up uh, and monitor and grow your social media and measure it. Um, the pricing seems to be somewhat uh, reasonable there as well for a one-person team. And then uh, Xbeon is one of the bigger boys, uh, which really takes something like um, Basecamp and project manage it and applies it to your social media strategy all the way from publishing to content planning to helping moderate um, your social media spaces obviously analyzing and during workflow control uh, I don't have uh, pricing on that it wasn't available on their site that I could find but it was mentioned at the summit uh, by some of the, the companies uh, that were participating in it uh, initial kind of review of it seems like it this is actually a very powerful tool if you're looking to kind of take your social media to the your, your social media strategy to the next level um, so I've gone and actually requested a demo hoping to to get a sense of what it looks like and, and can it save us time uh, even if it is a little bit a little bit more pricey so be an interesting tool, tool to check out and another topic I wanted to touch on just briefly is is your sharing connected and we talked a little bit about the cross posting uh, but where do you share and how do you cross connect and how much of, of that do you do um, is it is it enough to post at one place do you feel like that's going to be a, a, a good uh, path to go down um, or do you need to vary it uh, we talked a little bit about this earlier but it's important to consider how your sharing is connected across the, the different platforms and then ultimately, what's the sustaining motivation for somebody on both sides of the social media equation? What's the sustaining motivation for a school to be in the space? Uh, and that goes back to this uh, strategic goals. Where, what ultimately is our goal as schools working in social media? And I see it as kind of two. One, it's to, uh, well, I, I guess I actually see it as three. One is to bring new families into the school so we can sustain ourselves uh, as as um, viable institutions in our communi communities. The other is to be able to communicate the good news of what's going on at the school uh, with uh, news uh, and traditional media sources. And then the third is to connect our alumni back. And those are kind of the sustaining motivation on the school side. But you have to flip the coin, I think, and talk about what's the sustaining motivation for a prospective parent, a news media organization, or an alum to stay in those spaces and have conversations with you. And so that's another important consideration is what's the sustaining motivation, whether you're on the uh, bring them inside or the stay and hang around side. Okay. Um, talking about sustaining motivation, I, I share this briefly um, on our school news page and hopefully not uncommon to, to other schools out there, we do allow people to uh, share our news through social media. So whether they tweet out an article or put it on Facebook or LinkedIn or Google Plus is important. Um, an interesting stat along those lines, um, there are currently roughly one million sites out there that have a social layer to them. Uh, if you're not one of those one million sites, I suggest that. Uh, highly suggest you do that and it's not simply putting your uh, the logos of Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and whatever else there might be out there on your page to redirect it's allowing people to interact directly on your site with social media tools um, a 
presently 150 million people on Facebook engage with Facebook through another site. So that means I'm on a news article here at Ravenscroft and I click the Facebook thing to like it. Um, that's almost 20% uh, of current Facebook users using Facebook through another site. And so that's an important thing to keep, keep in mind. It's not just about having presence uh, on these uh, social media sites, but also on your site alone. Um, how are you allowing people to interact? And, and you'll notice that if you're, if you're a Facebook user and you're logged into Facebook uh, and you visit other sites, sometimes it'll actually have you already logged in for the ability to comment on something. And I think that's something that schools really need to consider. Um, how do you bring that into your own sites? Because that allows you to determine what's shareable. Um, this was uh, a slide that I kind of pulled together from things that I saw from uh, Jay Tobin, who's in charge of Ignite Social Media here in Raleigh. And there's a sweet spot he talks about. And it's the spot between things that people share and things that your school shares. And then what are the shareable moments at your school, which means the things that you share and the things that people share come together. And there's that kind of aha moment of, hey, you know what, I'm going to let somebody else know about that. And so what causes people to do that? So for instance, for me, when anything that comes out on Raven's Cross Facebook page um, that is kind of um, newsworthy or celebratory, I share it on my Facebook page right away, but that, that's because, A, I work here, but my kids also go here, and I want people to know what's going on at the school uh, where my children attend to kind of get the good news out there. Because um, there was an interesting uh, statistic that said 90% of decisions today, purchasing decisions, are made through a social connection. And that's not necessarily online. Uh, but it's referrals, and so if your families aren't sharing the good word of your school, whether it's in their social circles or online and social media, it makes it that much harder to kind of continue to ramp up and have people interested in your school, especially considering that st statistics of 90% of people are making decisions based upon uh, a social connection. So what are those shareable moments at your school? What are you putting up that will... Um, excite people about sharing, uh, getting them engaged in conversation about the good things that are going on at your school. So it's a limited slice. What's shareable is a limited slice between what people share and what your school shares. So you have to kind of consider what those shareable moments are. Are there questions that are coming up, Madeline? Yes, I have a couple really good questions coming in. Um, going back just a few slides to your social media management tools, have you mm -hmm. heard any downsides relative to um, using Facebook through tools such as Hootsuite? Um, I think there's always going to be uh, downsides to any time you're connecting tools. Um, I haven't heard of any directly, um, but I also haven't been searching for those. Uh, stories either. Uh, but I think any time that you have software tool and software tool communicating between each other through uh, an API, there's going to be chances that there could be issues. And that's regardless of whether that's your, your school website talking to your school database or anywhere else in between. Sure. Yeah, there are, there are a couple um, conversations that are coming up about how Facebook specifically is kind of docking um, third-party apps. So I'll, I'll track some of those down and tweet those out to you later today um, for the people that are asking. Um, let's see. If we go back just a little bit, are there, are there best practice answers to the question of cross-posting across social media outlets? Do you think, um, is there a best practice that you would recommend? I know we talked about what we would do. Yeah, so I think the best practice there is um, is probably to, all right, so the question is how many times are you going to be in a space over the course of a week um, and kind of chart, okay, let's break that up. You know, I, I have 10 posts this week, and this week I'm going to put uh, five things in Facebook, three things on Twitter, and... Um, 
two things on LinkedIn. And I'm going to do that because the five things that I have chosen for Facebook are mostly um, things that are either admissions or alumni related and I know that I have a, a heavy amount of users in those areas that are current parents and alum. Uh, and I'm going to do the other things in Twitter because I know I have a lot of media outlets following me and those may be athletic or fine arts based or awards won by kids or faculty. And then the other two are actually we have job openings and I'm going to post those on LinkedIn. And then I just kind of decide, I think you need to decide what fits what market is probably the best way to determine that rather than just kind of flooding it. Absolutely. Thank you for reiterating that point for us. Um, another question came in, besides Ravenscroft, what are some other schools that um, you might recommend schools to take a look at? Um, so th there's a, it depends on what avenue you want to go down. Um, if you're talking about just doing um, admissions and um, advancement sort of public relations side, um, there's a number of, of schools that are, are doing a good job. If you're talking about um, seeing what's being used in um, the classroom, which I'm not even talking about today, but um, one of the ones that comes to mind um, is uh, Gould Academy. I always kind of love their mashup page and, and their bloggers, um, which is a great example You know, if you're talking about uh, anybody who's in a boarding school and having a boarding school life experience and having kids blog about it. Um, I think that's a great resource there, although if you're if you're looking for sites, um, just always be careful. There was a great post on Ed Social Media today about uh, copying, and so make sure that if you find something you like, you make it your own. Um, and then from the, um, from the um, side of, of students, um, you have uh, uh, Wilbraham and Munson, uh, the WA uh, MASH up, I think is a great site as well. So those are two, but I can post some more resources as well uh, of other sites that you want to take a look at. Great. Thank you, Jason. I think so far those are all the questions that have come in. I will let you know if more show up for us. Okay. All right. So moving on. Um, this is. Um, the social media cycle. And I think it's important to keep this in mind um, when you're dealing uh, in spaces because first of all you have to decide, okay, who's going to see the message? And if they see it, what is going to entice them to click on it? And once they click on it, what's going to entice them to have a desire to share that? And once they have that desire to share it, are they going to share it and with whom? And so as you're crafting your messages, one thing that you may want to keep in mind, um, things that I've heard over and over again, is that um, when you post anywhere, images seem to have uh, a bigger draw than just words. So if you're posting something on um, Facebook, for example, make sure you have an image that's going to draw people's attention because words alone won't do that. Um, so as you're crafting messages, if you have images in them, that'll bring them in. That'll actually get them to see it. And then from there, the content uh, should be lively enough and interesting enough for them to go ahead and click it. And then the rest is actually psychology. You know, uh, whether there's a desire to share it and whether or not they actually share it depends on how they feel about the institution. Um, and so how many people do you have on your Facebook page or how many people do you have that are following you on Twitter? Um, we'll kind of make up that. It's actually an interesting mathematical equation they were talking about um, at the Internet Summit between math and psychology, but they offered up this social media cycle, and I thought it was a good representation of uh, kind of see, click, desire, and share when you're talking about social media in schools. And that kind of goes along with, um, I think, when you get to the end of it, you're talking about um, social media is your brand. And I know schools don't like to talk about themselves as a brand, but they are. Um, and so it goes back to the very part um, earlier on we were talking about um, if you're not telling your story, somebody else will be. So you want to make sure that you put enough stuff out there so that people are talking about your institution in your areas so that people get excited about the possibility of their kids attending there. And I think that's really you know, one of the greatest stories of social media is being, or the greatest selling tools of social media is it, it really allows you to shape your story and shape your brand so that 
when you mention your school in conversation, um, you really want people to uh, say something along the lines of Ravenscroft. Now that, I understand, is a great institution. I've heard a lot of great things about it. I think you never want somebody to, to start off when you mention your school, the first words out of their mouth to be, oh, because that then tails into things like, oh, you're too expensive, or oh, I only heard this about you or that about you. That oh is kind of that, that bad line. So you, the more that you can tell your story and get the word out so that they're talking about mentioning your school first when you mention it to them, that's always a good thing to remember. All right, some things that I want to talk about quickly uh, here, we only have a few minutes left, is when you're talking about social media um, as your brand, um, Facebook has some core concepts. And I think um, if you actually Google Facebook core concepts, it's on their developer page talking about social design and plugins. Uh, the one piece that I found really helpful was the social plugins piece, talking about how you uh, can use just basic HTML code that allows anybody who's already logged into Facebook to appear to be um, interacting with your site even though they're not logged into your site, um, which allows them to share what the good news of what's going on. So I, I definitely recommend uh, just reading these um, and keeping up with the core concepts in Facebook, whether you decide to use them or not. Um, the more information you have about what they're doing, the better. And then one of the other components um, that is out there now is edge rank. Uh, and so what's your edge rank when you're talking about your institution, uh, which talks about total posts and the engagement on those posts and the lifetime on the posts and how long have they lived and who's sharing them. Um, if you haven't checked out Edge Rank Checker just yet, um, it's it's a good way to kind of just get a sense of what's going on in your page. It analyzes all of your posts and uh, gives you some pretty good feedback on um, some good analytics uh, on Facebook. It's a good starting point. And then also uh, tweet reach on the Twitter side. Um, shows up to 50 recent tweets. So I did this this morning. So the last 50 tweets that contained uh, the hashtag Ed Social Media reached almost 30,000 people. And so that was an exposure of almost 80,000 impressions. And you kind of see that there that about 20,000 people saw one tweet, uh, about three saw two to three, 4,000 saw four to seven, and um, a little under 2,000 saw seven or more tweets from Ed Social Media. And so I think that's a good um, a good way to kind of get a quick capture of are tweets working, who are they reaching based upon the people that follow you. Um, you can kind of see down there at the bottom there the top four uh, Twitterers who've contributed um, to the reach of Ed Social Media are uh, listed there. So that's an interesting tool that you might want to play with. Um, it takes just a, a minute to put in a hashtag and then run the run the report. So. All right, so in the uh, few minutes I have remaining, I'm just going to touch on connecting with social media um, from a personal learning network side of things. And this will actually go fast. I have two quick stories to tell uh, about how it can happen. So the first is actually about an AP biology teacher here at uh, Ravenscroft. And it's the story of Zoe Welsh, one of our AP biology instructors. And she came to um, attend, we have hold an infusing innovation uh, workshop. It's optional beginning of August every year for, for teachers who want to get involved with a number of different things, a number of different things we're doing on campus. But I always offer a personal learning network um, kind of primer for folks. And, and Zoe came in 2010 and listened and kind of just didn't have any movement with anything in the social media spaces, and that was fine. She came back in 2011, and we went through the same thing, and we gave her a, a few more tips and tricks, and actually, um, she got a copy of connect, uh, Communicating and Connecting with Social Media, uh, which has the rubrics in it, and the next thing I knew, she was on Twitter. Um, she was sharing and connecting with folks on Twitter. Um, the next thing after that is I get an email from her telling me that the technology bug is bitten, and she's created a blog through some of the tools that we use. This is her blog site. And because she was uh, blogging here about things she was doing in her class, and then using Twitter to connect with other people, she mentioned that here in this email, uh, within three months' time, all of a sudden, she was um, been asked to write for the Science Muse blog. 
So um, basically what took almost a year and a half of time, really just three months of her deciding that it was something she wanted to do, um, she's gone from somebody who wasn't really into social media to somebody who jumped on the bandwagon, used it as a professional learning tool, and then now all of a sudden rather quickly has become somebody who is sharing with others through um, another blog site, which is, is I guess kind of how a lot of us came to be on um, Ed social media as bloggers. And then the other story is actually uh, the story of communicating and connecting with social media. And it goes a little something like this. So that's kind of the power of social media. It actually started off with a uh, teacher who works here in Wake County uh, who knew of me through Twitter and asked if we wanted to have lunch and we had conversations and then he sent a direct message to somebody else on Twitter, do you want to write a book together? And then he hit me back on Twitter, do you want to write a book together? And then all of a sudden we started writing this book which was all done through Google Docs and electronic communications and actually Eric uh, Scheniger I didn't meet until a conference about uh, three weeks ago and so we wrote the book totally without having never spoken or talked um, which I think is a pretty powerful testament to how social media can connect people and allow them to do work without ever having a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, finally the last uh, is the future of social media. Um, I'd like to say that I have the answers there. Uh, I definitely think that it's not or I definitely know that it's not going away um, especially with folks being so social in nature um, and the more corporations you see with Facebook and Twitter only tells you that that's the way that they're headed to interact the conversations all at Internet Summer 2011 we're talking about how do you take your business and make it social and I think for me that statement uh, at that conference how do you take your business and make it social or is your business social and I thought you know what schools are social that's how we were founded. That's how we started out. We're a social community. And so if we can't get on the bandwagon and do social media right, um, I'm not sure who can because it's already built into the fabric of who we are. And so that's, I kind of leave it there uh, with some room for some questions and throw up my contact information in case anybody wants to, to reach out a little bit later uh, and have more conversations about communicating and connecting with social media. Great, thank you so much, Jason. That was great. Um, I don't have any actually questions that have queued up because we've gone through several of them throughout the day. Um, I think let me just reload the hashtag one more time and make sure I'm not discluding anyone. Um, thank you so much for bringing all of those real life statistics to us and giving us, um, you know, tangible examples that people can go back and take a look at schools that are finding great success. Um, throughout the process. Um, it was really great listening to all of the tips that you had. I think everyone will walk away with something they can implement at their school tomorrow, today even. Um, so thank you very much, Jason, for pulling all this together. If there are any other questions that we didn't get completely answered for you, you can contact Jason at his um, contact information right here. You can shoot any of the Ed Social Media staff, either um, DM on Twitter or you can email us at info at edsocialmedia.com. Um, We'll, we're happy to help in any way we can. And um, since we have Jason on the line, we are going to double plug our, um, our boot camp that we're hosting at Ravenscroft next week. And Jason actually will be in the room uh, helping guide um, the presentation and process throughout the day. And Jason, are you giving away a couple of your signed books? I am. Uh, I have two, two copies that uh, I will, will raffle off and then go ahead and sign for the winners. Great. Thank you so much. So if you're in the um, North Carolina area, it's December 7th at Ravenscroft. Um, otherwise, we do have another webinar um, on December 13th. Um, and this will be talking primarily about video with Jason Malvin. Um, so the webinar is called Simple Successful Video for Schools, so be sure to tune in on December 13th as well. A special thanks to our webinar sponsors, Admissions Quest and Proof, for supporting this event. Um, and I think that's all for today. So thanks again, Jason, and let us know if anyone has questions or look for a blog post tomorrow with the captured webinar. Thanks so much.